You're listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lane. Mountain gardening can be challenging, but with Ken's tips, tricks, and garden advice, you'll reap huge rewards. Now, welcome back to The Mountain Gardener. And welcome to this week's edition of The Mountain Gardener. This is your host, Ken Lane, talking about uh, the outside of your home, the landscapes, the plants, the weeds, the bugs, the things that make the outside go, and it is uh, going to be a glorious spring. We are taking a look at the daylilies are coming up, the iris are coming up, the daffodils. I mean, spring is, it's March, and spring is just days away, and the landscape is showing itself. And so I've got Forsythia here at the garden center. They opened this week. That was that uh, shrub with a beautiful, just covered in yellow gold, Uh, Flowers before it even leaves. Just everything is gold. They're showing off. The Daphne went into bloom this week. I even had rhododendrons show up, uh, just starting to crack color. Not just crack color. I mean, they're in bloom at the garden center. So they love the storm system that came through. They love that bright days, cool nights. These spring blooming plants, they love everything about spring. And so there's a whole series of plants that you can put in the ground Right now, that that kind of announce every year from this point forward, they will announce spring for you. So the lilacs are huge buds on them. Even even when you take a close look at the conifers, that would be the spruce and the pine, the the firs, the cypress, the cedars, uh, junipers, these evergreen plants, the buds or the buttons, the, the, uh, the, the leading indicator, they haven't elongated yet. But you can tell they're swelling like crazy. So the sap is flowing up and down the plants. So you're seeing this this announcement of spring starting to happen. Of course, the pansies are in so much. They just love everything about this week. They love a, a, a light dusting of snow. They love chilly nights. They love bright, bright days. But they don't want it to be above really 80 degrees. They love this whole spring season. One thing you really have to watch this time of year, or or not watch, help. One thing you really have to do to help your landscape is fertilize. What you'll find is the mountains of Arizona, we really don't have a lot of soil or topsoils. And what little bit of topsoil we did have before they built our house, the contractor came in with a, with a front loader or backhoe and just scraped everything off. And so you're left with this bedrock or caliche layer or sterile clay, and there's nothing really viable in your soil. This is really difficult for you Midwestern folks to wrap your brain around. You're, you're thinking dirt is dirt. Arr, it'll be fine. I've, all I've ever done is thrown a twig in the ground. It just grows. That's not the way it is in the mountains of Arizona. Where you've got eight foot of topsoil, yes. You corn farmers, I mean, you soybean folks, you, you know this... I mean, thick layers of topsoil that produce rich abundance of life. And it's just magical the way that happens. You folks from California in that Central Valley where agriculture is just exudes life. That's not the way it works here. That topsoil layer actually gives you living mycorrhizal fungi, the the worms start to grow. You can tell, you dig a hole and you can see that it's alive. In the mountains of Arizona, uh, you, you don't see that. Our topsoil, the layer that was there, it tends to get flushed down the dry creeks and down the rivers and down the, the, the it goes downhill during our monsoon season. So the little bit of organics that we did have, it gets picked up and floated away because of the way our rain happens in the mountains is it happens all at once. It's either dry or you've got too much of it. And so it lifts a lot of these nutrients and takes them downstream. And so you're left with this little tiny layer of topsoil. But that was before you built your house. Now you're left with no topsoil. And so you'll find that you have to amend your gardens more. Uh, I I was just topping off all my flower beds, all my vegetable beds, getting ready for planting season. I'm going to put kale, cabbage. Lisa and I are big into juicing. So I'm going to front load. Things that love to be juiced, that are high in antioxidants, irons. I mean, just there's nothing healthier for you 
than kale, fresh and raw in a salad or, or juiced. Or There's virtually nothing healthier. Spinach, same way. I think go down the road with bok choy and some of these other, other types of uh, uh, collard greens and uh, beets and carrots. And they're so good for you, but they need some soil. And so I tend to amend my soils heavy so they'll receive these seed or these plants and just start taking off. So I'm, I'm amending my soil now. I've got that going. So then I'll let that sit. I put manures and, and I'm basically our premium mulch. It's a compost. Put those two things down. Blend that in. And then, and then I'll add some fertilizer and some soil sulfur. That's kind of my thing. That's, what I, that's how I get my soils ready. If I get into it really deep here, maybe I'll go into my actual recipe, my formula. But really, what I really wanted to get across right now is I have finished all of my pruning, including the roses. So I finished the last one this weekend. Uh, I've, I've, and then I fertilized everything in the landscape this week. In fact, during that snowstorm, when was that? Tuesday or Wednesday or Monday? When, earlier this week, there was a good, good storm. It was snowing outside. I'm going, oh, this is like the perfect storm. Oh, my gosh. My neighbors think I'm nuts. But I'm out there with a hand spreader <laughs> spreading fertilizer and sulfur over the entire land, and weed preventer. I just finished all of that. And so I'm taking advantage of the moisture, having it take it into the ground. It just was was ideal. I mean, snow is like the perfect media for getting nutrients deep within the soil so that the plants can pick it up. That will increase my flower buds. It'll increase my lilacs. It'll increase the jasmines, the camellias. I even have magnolias. There's a hardy magnolia that grows I'm at 5,700 foot level. It'll go down to, I think, minus 10 degrees. So it's just been in my yard for many years, thrived. Beautiful, big white magnolias, uh, flowers, that scent that fills up the front of the landscape. I put that out, but it thrives on fertilizer. It needs more food. And so your soil does not have hardly any food. If it does have, it doesn't have even close to enough to to feed these plants as they wake up. They're going to be very hungry. They're going to ignite with new growth. They're going to use up any food they had they took in last fall, and they'll use it up. And if you don't replenish that, I think on the leading edge, the plants will be left wanting. So your flowers will be smaller. They'll be muted. They won't have the color. They won't have the fragrance. So if you fertilize right now, uh, that's, the, that's the ticket. And so in the next month, in the month of March, sometime in the next few weeks, you should fertilize everything in the landscape. I'm going to go into detail on this, on why, but I, I really do think you should even fertilize the natives on your property, the native pinion pines, the native ponderosas. If you've got an oak tree that's just an emery oak that's just magnificent, I mean, it's got character, it's probably 400 years old, I would even fertilize that. And that's kind of sacrilege to some of you purists. You zero scape native, oh, you should, should have to do anything to them. I think that's the case. If before you built the house, before you changed the water flow with roads and driveways, and I think the natives in your yard are more dependent on you than you think they are to keep healthy. And that's why we have outbreaks of scale and bark beetle and flathead borer, and we have issues in the forest because we're changing the forest and the way the plants were at, have been living there for 200 years. Now we change that. So the last 10 years, we've been living with you with them. You had contractors compressing the root zones, and it's just different. And so a little bit of care with your natives goes a long way. And I think it's towards the back side of the show, I'll, I'll tell you what I did with my pinion pines, my pine trees, to really keep them healthy. Healthy. I've got an antibiotic that I, I give to them that really makes them luscious and beautiful and keeps them healthy and keeps the bugs out of them. So Waters Lane coming in the studio with your garden questions. Of course, we've got to get her in. Always a joy to share the, the studio with Lisa. Be right back with more on the Mountain Gardeners with Ken and now Lisa Lane in just a moment. Be right back. Don't you change that dial. You're listening to local garden expert Ken Lane, also known as the Mountain Gardener. Ken can be found throughout the week at Waters Garden Center in Prescott. Listen each week as he answers timely garden questions unique to mountain landscapes. 
Hi, Waters here with this week's Plant of the Week and our show-off for Scythias. A new standout for Scythia with very large, very bright solar yellow flowers that adorn the plant from head to toe. Relax! This showy spring shrub is beautiful and requires no pruning or cleanup. This show-off is just days away from bloom and limited, so don't wait until these for Scythia are all gone at just $21. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott. Where people who love show-off for Scythia love to shop. The colors of spring are bursting at Water's 56th Spring Open House. Talk directly to our farmers as they show off the newest flowers, brightest evergreens, and this year's newest bloomers. Friday, we have free shamrocks with the purchase of evergreen trees. Saturday and Sunday, it's impromptu garden classes, sidewalk art, cornhole contest, and drawings. Join the garden fun at Water's Garden Center's 56th Spring Open House, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, March 16th through 18th. 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott. You're listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lane. Mountain gardening can be challenging, but with Ken's tips, tricks, and garden advice, you'll reap huge rewards. Now welcome back to The Mountain Gardener. And we are in the studio with my favorite gal. We just like tag team this family business called Waters Garden Center. And so this is the time of year that garden center owners, we live for. I mean, just planting season is upon us. And so welcome to the studio, Lisa. Thank you very much. Here. We've, we've been uh, crazy busy. I mean, with customers <laughs> and with trucks and with, with it's, it's, it's a challenge to fill up a garden center. So we got just over two acres here. And we're going to fill it up from, we, we use maybe a third of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then all of a sudden we go, we fill up the rest of it. And right. so uh, to to get that, I, I was calculating how many trucks it takes to fill up the garden center, <laughs> how many semis. You shouldn't and, do that. And I converted it into rail cars. So if oh. you're thinking railroad cars, basically it would be about eight cars oh. filled just from stop from these big, not the small ones, the mm-hmm. big cars, about yeah. eight of them. So we lived in Skull Valley for years. And we were right there on Kirkland Creek, in between mm-hmm. Kirkland Creek and the railroad tracks. They make the bend. And so you get used to trains and just right. counting them. You can check the economy oh, based on true. the trains. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I just, if we just convert it going eight cars. That's like almost around the entire bend of the farm in Skull Valley. <laughs> That's and a the, lot. And the thing with that is, you know, when they pack these trucks, they're not like single on the floor. Oh, no. They pack them like floor to ceiling. Top pot on top of pot on top of pot as yeah. hot, much as they can. I mean, they really pack them in there. So. We had some trees coming out of the truck that came in uh, uh, Thursday. Mm-hmm. Is that right? Yeah, Thursday, late this week. It's just a couple days ago. And uh, the out of this semi, the top is only eight foot tall yeah. to semi. Uh, we're pulling out 25 foot trees. Right. <laughs> You're laid down, going to the bow, <laughs> to the bow, to the uh, bulkhead, mm-hmm. and it's exciting. It's like Christmas. It is for for Christmas gardeners. In March. Yeah, What's we, on this track? <laughs> you know, we had I, I don't hundreds of trees. Literally mm-hmm. hundreds of trees come off this week. Of t- t- fruit trees. There's some Alberta tr- uh, uh, spruce that are peaches. Uh, oh, we peaches! Alberta peaches. Alberta peaches yeah. <laughs> That are like beautiful. I've yeah. never seen anything like them. A trunk on it. I mean, it looks like a full tree. Yeah, they're very nicely oh. filled out, mature, oh. pruned well. They're beautiful. You're not going to be waiting for fruit on those guys. Be- for, for us, we go and we go to tour the farms. We go, the, this truck came out of Oregon. We fly to Portland. We rent a car and we spend days just roaming the countryside. Mm-hmm. Look at these little, some of them are little bumpkin farms, backyard. Some of them are full on thousands of acres. We go and tour and hand pick. So we did that last fall, but to actually see them come in, yeah. they look even better on the ground than they do <laughs> in the field. So right. you're kind of hand picking that, those varieties. So mm-hmm. it's just exciting. It is fun. Very fun to do. So before we go on, uh, maybe we should cover some garden questions. I don't oh, know, sure. just more about our, I feel better just releasing some of that pent up <laughs> tiredness <laughs> from unloading trucks. It is, so, it is nice a lot of work, but it's fun. Yeah. Um, I have a question from Penny in Prescott. See, last year she has a Bradford pear. Last year it yeah. got decimated by the thrip early okay. in the spring. She wants to know, is there anything she can do to kind of 
control that this year so the tree has a prettier look to it. Yeah, so thrip, it's a little tiny bug. It's also called a noceum. So some of you can get bit in the spring, usually in April. A little tiny bug will light on you and it just scratches your skin, makes these little welts. Well, it's a noceum or thrip. They do the same thing with trees or with, with shrubs, flowers. So they get into your daffodils that are in full bloom. Iris. Uh, iris, the full <laughs> bloom. And they'll, they're, they should bloom for like two weeks, and they bloom for like two days because mm-hmm. the thrip get in there and, and eat the flower. And so they show up about the time the daffodils show up. So that'll be another mm, two, three, four weeks. So for, for into this month, 1st of April, that's when your thrip will show up. Uh, what to do, be aware that that can happen. So they get on the leaf, that tender new leaf, they'll scrape. They've got a rasping mouth part. They actually scrape the foliage, the, the flesh off. And so the, the leaf actually winces, actually cringes in pain. So you'll see it actually wrinkle. Um, and this bug is just eating the plant alive. It doesn't usually kill it. It just makes it really ugly. What to do, I would, if you're talking pear trees, uh, I would say any fruit trees or whenever you can, keep it organic. And so we've got a spray on the shelf out there. It's called Captain Jack's Dead Bug Brew. It's a it's an organic. You spray it on the foliage. It gets on the leaf, and then the bug comes in and eats the leaf, eats some of that Captain's Jack, and 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 then dies. And so it's a great preventative. I would use it as a preventative, not as a as a uh, reactionary thing. Mm-hmm. Just know about the time. The daffodils are blooming at two week intervals. Give it at least a couple sprays, maybe three, until that leaf gets mature enough, thick enough, and then you should be out of the the risk of thrip and bugs and that kind of stuff. I just take a hose in sprayer, hose it down with Captain Jack's Dead Bug Brew every two weeks in, in April, first part of May, and you should be the most beautiful tree you've ever seen, especially if you're fertilizing right now. You set the stage for new foliage, and then you're protecting the foliage. It'll be a game changer. Okay, good answer. Next question is from Dan. He wants to know if you can use the gopher bait uh, in the garden, or should he restrict it just to other parts of the yard? Okay, so it is a poison. So it's zinc sulfate is the actual ingredient on that. If he's got, if he's getting the bait from us. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it's zinc sulfate. We use that one or phosphate. Well, which one is it? I think it's phosphate. So, z- anyway, zinc. <laughs> <laughs> we won't get technical. I got all these labels in my head <laughs> floating around going, which kind of zinc was it? Uh, anyway, a little bit of zinc is okay. A lot of it, not okay. And so, But I'm just generally under the rule. If you're using other people's bait, you can use strychnine, which is the most toxic Ooh, thing you it. could possibly want to yeah. put even touch, much less put in your garden. So I got to be careful because this is broadcast all over Arizona. Be careful. It's a poison. It's made to kill things. So I generally don't introduce that into my edible gardens. Flowers, fine. Trees, fine. I don't, I even, even orchards, I think, fine. But I, I think if you're, I would use a trap mm-hmm. or I would use a gas. There's a bomb. You can throw in the little flare that asphyxiates them. I would do it that way. And the rest of the garden, maybe use the poisons up out there, just out of safety. It just makes right. sense. I would agree. Yeah. And raised beds lined with <laughs> yeah. chicken wires and can save you a whole lot of aggravation. Yeah. If you're making a new raised bed, please come talk to us. We'd love to show you how to. To, to, to set the stage so that you don't have issues down the road. We've just seen so much with other gardeners, mm-hmm. but lining the bottom of a, of a new raised bed with chicken wire, oh, keeps all the pack rats and gophers out. Right, right. Zinc phosphate is what they use on nut trees to help oh, with fruit production. You're right. There we go. <laughs> we get confused so easily. Yeah. Um, so David also wants to know, he knows it's time to fertilize, but he yeah. wants to know, can he use the soil activator at the same time, or do they have to be used at different times? Guys, that's a good question. Or sulfur. I was mentioning sulfur mm-hmm. earlier in the show. Uh, it, it doesn't matter, folks. Just get them all on. It doesn't matter which one goes first. It doesn't matter. I would say use the all-purpose plant food is the most critical. Then you, you'd want to use your additives. So the soil activator is humic acid. So if you're doing a lot of new lawns, new uh, if you're getting your vegetables ready, your, that garden plot or flowers, it's going to help plants root 
faster and deeper. That's what soil activator does. So we'll, we recommend that for new areas. If you're putting a new lawn in, for sure, add soil activator. But then which one do you put on first, the food or the – it doesn't matter. Just get them on, and that's fine. So uh, earlier this week, I put on uh, all-purpose plant food, soil sulfur because I want to lower the pH. It brings the color out. And I put weed and grass preventer on the areas where I, I have more weeds. Mm-hmm. I did it all like, but um, boom, took me like an hour, and I was just done yep. in the snow. During the, it was snowing on me. It was, it was starting snow was getting in the in the <laughs> hopper, and it was starting to coagulate and clump up the fertilizer stuff. Just get it on, mm-hmm. get it on fast, and let the rains and stuff uh, activate it. You usually with those products, you'll need moisture, rain. Within 30 days Mm -hmm. is the general rule. So that's whether it's a weed and grass preventer, keeping the the weeds at bay, or fertilizer. You need moisture within 30 days to activate it and and take it in the soil. If not, hand water it. It's easy to get around that. Ken Elisa Lane and the Mountain Gardeners. Great questions this week, folks. Be right back. The Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of Arizona with local garden expert and the Mountain Gardener himself, Ken Lane. Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. In a new place, it's difficult to know who to trust, how to get help at the house, and which nursery will simply do what they say they'll do. At Waters Garden Center, we're here to help, in the landscape at least. Our team of plant ambassadors know your neighborhood, the plants that add color, increase privacy, and add fragrance and beauty. And we can show you exactly how to plant locally, or we have teams to do all the work for you. We are Ken and Lisa Lane, and we guarantee our plants will live up to every promise here at Waters Garden Center. You're listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lane. Mountain gardening can be challenging, but with Ken's tips, tricks, and garden advice, you'll reap huge rewards. Now, welcome back to The Mountain Gardener. We are securing the, the final details of our spring open house. So, so Waters Garden Center has been around for 56 years. This is our 56th spring open house, 1962. March of 1962, Waters Garden Center began. It was the first garden center in northern Arizona. And and every year, we we bring our growers into the garden center. So we we have you can talk directly to the folks that grow or have invented, have actually patented. They've actually developed a certain strain uh, of plant unique to Arizona. So. Uh, they're they're going to be here. You can just talk to them uh, March 17th and 18th. That weekend is our spring open house. It looks like it's going to be the timing's perfect for spring open house. Uh, and we're starting to fill the garden center up so that we're preparing for this. Trees came this week. Here's a little insider tip on on trees. We had our evergreens show up a couple weeks ago. We just had our deciduous trees and fruit trees show up. This week, out of, let's say you get 10 apple trees or 10 maple trees or 10 aspens, out of, out of those 10, there's about, there's a percentage of them that are just over the top. I mean, I can't believe the beauty. This is like the perfect tree. Oh my goodness. That's gorgeous. Then you've got the rest of the block. And so we hand pick all of our trees, but even out of, even with that, there's some of them that are obviously better than others. If you're thinking about planting a tree in the yard, you, you want to grab, you want to know when that truck comes and grab them early because you get the cream of the crop. Literally, that's where that comes from. There's, there's, there's a part of that crop that's just, wow, oh my goodness. And once you get a wow tree, it stays that way for life, for the life of the tree. Shrubs, not so much. A red tip photinia, eh, with some trimming, you can make it pretty. But with the tree... Once it has a dog leg, once it has a mark on the bark, once it has a lopsided crown, once it has, it generally stays that way. And so they're kind of like people. Once, I mean, there's some beautiful people that you want to put on the front of magazines and just take pictures of them and look at them all day long. Trees are kind of like that. And there's folks that are just kind of normal, just like, just like, 
They're, they belong. They got a face for radio, like me. So they're, they're, you're, I'm not the one you would pick in the lineup for the most beautiful tree in the, in the, in the yard, but you want those. And so you can, you can have first dibs by just being in there and you've got plenty of time to plant. And so we're at the start of the planting season and it goes really in the mountains of Arizona. We really don't stop until the end of October, middle of November until the ground freezes, especially at the higher elevations. But we're so mild. We just don't get hot in the summer. We're not like Phoenix or Yuma or these hotter areas, the desert areas, Tucson. We're mild. This is where people from the desert come to get out of the heat. So we keep planting. The main thing that gets in your way is when when that plant leafs and we've got this prevailing southwest wind that's very dry as that tender new leaf is coming out, the main thing you need to do is watch your watering for those plants. You want to be more exact. So it's, it's that tender leaf dries out, and so you get this burning mark on the end. It'll recover just fine. It's, it doesn't kill it at all. But that's the only thing that gets in the way. So if you can get those plants in the ground before they leaf out, you have, you have less transplant shock is what they call it. Uh, so it's better to go early before they leaf. We're already starting the willows. They're leafed. They're in the racks with leaves. I mean, they're small, but you can go, whoa, the, look at that. It's spring. Willows always announce spring. Uh, the, the crab apples are right behind them. This beautiful red blossoming tree, just stunning. The buds are ginormous and starting just the leading edge, edge of showing color. But March is when spring hits and March is when the trees start to bloom. It just, just starts, goes from there. Then the red buds will follow that. And then your service berries will follow that. You'll see all this series of, of spring that happens. One thing I am doing for my personal evergreens, I'm putting plant protector on my trees, my evergreens, especially the pinyon pines and ponderosas, the native evergreens. The scale is early. There's a little bug that crawls up the tree and sucks the life out of the needle. The plant protector s solves that. It, get, it gets rid of that scale. It, it, Bark beetle are burrowing into the side of ponderosas. You'll see little pinholes through the bark. That's a beetle that burrows in, eats the cambium layer underneath the bark, and girdles the tree, kills it. The plant protector solves that. So it's very easy. It's a liquid. You mix it up in a watering can. You pour it at the base of the, the trunk of the tree, and that's it. There's no sprays. There's no So easy to use. I cannot recommend this strong enough. Put plant protector on your evergreens uh, right away in the next month. Get it on there so that it protects those plants. Just because we're seeing such an onslaught this spring of pinion pine scale, which means everything else is going too. Anyway, just be aware. Be right back. The Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of Arizona with local garden expert and the Mountain Gardener himself, Ken Lane. Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. Growing up in Prescott, we knew spring was here when my grandmother's lilacs bloomed. I'm Lisa Waters Lane, and my grandma would be thrilled with the new Bloomerang Pink Perfume Lilacs at Waters Garden Center. New Peak Blooms fill the landscape with fragrance of grandma over and over again in the garden. Mine bloomed three times last year, making spring last well into fall, all for under $25. Lilacs like grandma used to grow, and better. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott. And we are back with Lisa Waters Lane in the studio. She comes each week. This is her segment. Wherever she wants to go, talk about anything, including her good-looking husband. <laughs> 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 but we get her insider tip on, on just, I think it's good to have the woman's touch on, on landscaping, just mm -hmm. on the gardens. And so you've got such a flair. So I thought, this, we just have to make this not just a man. Most gardening shows are all about some man from Texas or someplace. Got to talk with the draw. You, go, real you know, slow. we just we got some some plants. We got to do we got lawns, <laughs> tomatoes, and uh, yeah, just going. That's yeah. my favorite. Enough of was that. Jerry Baker. I used to just he was as nuts as nuts could be. But he 
he was fun. But he was fun. Yeah. He's and home remedies galore. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. hardly ever worked. I, mean, I tried some of those, and sometimes it worked. Sometimes they're going. Now oh, wait a minute, that didn't even close. <laughs> so that's why we we only share info over this show. Uh, no home remedies because we. I tried doing that early on, going a Jerry Baker approach. Yeah. Uh, soaps, but soaps have so many fragrances and right. additives anymore. There is no just plain soap. You can't do a soap. So I'd have half the customers kill plants because they got <laughs> it too strong. The other half, it didn't kill the bug. I went, okay, only over the counter suggestions yeah. where it's measured and exact every time. I mean, and you can have pick it up anywhere. Like- Put your chewing tobacco in yeah. this mix and then put your urine in it. I was <laughs> just like, no, I'm not spreading that in my yard. Yeah. I don't think Jerry's with us anymore. I think his, I, that's I like think decades ago. Gone. So you're almost dating yourself knowing who Jerry Baker is. I know. He's, he was <laughs> fun to listen to. We'll put it that way. So what do you got for us this week? What, what's going on? Well, we're definitely getting into that um, season where we want to think about our spring veggies. So if you're a spring okay. veggie person, which is usually your leafy vegetable, so yeah. it's leaves and roots. So your um, cabbage, your kale, Swiss chard, your lettuces, um, those are great things to be thinking about getting your beds ready and getting them ready to put in. I think also the seed, I think you could go yeah. for, like your seed crop, like radishes and carrots. And- well, that's the roots. That's where I was going. Oh, oh never mind. My bad. <laughs> You never let me finish. I just love a microphone. <laughs> I love being in the studio with you. <laughs> so there's the leafies and there's the roots. And the roots would be your carrots, your radishes, yeah. things like that. And those are going to do much better starting in the soil from seed uh, rather than trying to start them inside and little seed starters and move them outside. Um, it's better just to start those right in the ground. And spinach is another one. Even though it's a leafy one, it does. if you're going to do it from seed, start it outside. Uh, Don't try to grow it inside. So true. I think this is, you got to get rid of that myth. Sometimes in the mountains of Arizona, um, novice or amateur gardeners, they go, oh no, you can't plant now. Don't listen to Ken and Lisa. They don't know what they're talking about. Present Mother's Day is a time (laughs) when you start planting. These are folks that only do summer vegetables. That is true. The summer planting season starts Mother's Day at this four to... I don't know, 6,000 foot levels. Memorial Day for, for you folks mm-hmm. up in the higher elevations of White Mountains and Flag. Uh, but but after, that's the last frost date. Right. But a, a, a cabbage, a broccoli, a cauliflower, a, a, a bok choy, a, you can name it. All these leafy things, they don't like summer. No. They like the spring. They right. prefer spring planting. They'll bolt and the flavor gets lost in the mm-hmm. summer. So mm-hmm. if you're a, a square foot gardener, you're a high density gardener, you're trying to get more crops, so you're growing year round, that's a true gardener. They're starting now with their peas. They're mm-hmm. starting now with their their cabbages and lettuces and that kind of stuff. And then when they're done, they harvest that, then they'll flip that and they'll start planting their summer things. Right. In May, your tomatoes, mm-hmm. things that form a fruit, yeah, cucumbers. Yeah. And- You're right. I mean, now's the time to get those in. That's when you'll have the best flavor is planting them in the spring. That means you may have to have a sheet of frost cloth available in case we get another cold night or a light snow. You might want to cover and protect them a little bit, but it probably isn't going to kill them. They're going to be fine. Um, but they um, are so pretty, too. Uh, they, I love putting Swiss chard in a container and then planting some pansies or violas around it. It is just very, very attractive. I forget where we were. We go to so many gardens, but they had actually taken their, um, like a perennial bed and put Swiss chard as a border yeah. around it. Yeah. I was like, Oh, I got to do that. <laughs> now, if you have bunnies and javelina you may not want to do that that would be like an invitation (laughs) everything (laughs) likes to eat swiss chard or or the garden right yeah probably don't want to do that but great in containers uh, and mix some color in with it it's absolutely beautiful then you can just go out and pick it whenever you want that's the great thing about the leafy vegetables the more you harvest off of them the more they're going to grow Uh, so you can certainly get a lot of food off of those you did have some just stunning lavender come in 
mm. uh, th this week. So, and it's in bloom. It's showing some color. So right. this beautiful gray foliage. So I would go even farther than just veggies. I oh, think yeah. you could also put your herbs. So you had some stunning uh, rosemary. Oh, yes. just yes. perfect specimens come in right. this week. Those are things that are evergreen. Mm -hmm. That the animals that that you can put out front because the animals don't eat. They won't bother them. Herbs. That is true. Why is that? I don't know. They have very sensitive noses, I guess, and they don't like the smell. It's got to be the oils or something in there. Something they don't like. We like it, but they yeah. don't. It's too pungent. Or Our God just said, "I got to give them something." There you go. Yeah. <laughs> There we go. I got to give, give those God poor people yeah. something <laughs> that they can grow that the animals will leave alone. <laughs> um, we'll also be getting our potatoes and um, sweet onions in very, very soon. And those are great things to be um, growing as well, especially if you have kids. You got to grow potatoes. Yeah. Because it is so fun to go out and dig and find the potatoes out there. And you can also grow them in um, trash cans or large containers. And it's really fun. You just dump it over and then you can find all those potatoes. We grow potatoes in a five-gallon grower's bucket or a 10-gallon if you really like a harvest. And you just put a potato in the bottom. As it sprouts up, you backfill some more potting soil until it's to the top of the pot and then just let it grow. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the year, usually October, November, even into December, you just dump the pot over and... The harvest is is rich, so sure. great for Thanksgiving dinners. That kind. There's nothing better than a. I must be getting hungry. My mouth just watered. <laughs> Think about fresh potatoes, onions, garlics, all that rhubarb will be coming in. Asparagus. Usually that's middle. middle? Asparagus will be in um, April, April, first okay, part of yeah. April. So those gotcha. of you who want to get your asparagus asparagus bed going, that's a great time to do that. Uh, but it's. I love the leafy veggies because they just look so pretty. And you and I have gotten really into, well, you've gotten really into juicing. <laughs> every, I just drink every whatever morning. you juice. <laughs> <laughs> but beets, you can put in, um, there's a bull's bloods beets, say that three times fast, that have a real burgundy leaf to them. And the, and the leaves are just as nutritious, if not more nutritious than the actual beet. Yeah, antioxidants rich in which is cancer fighting mm -hmm. uh, nutrients is what the body uses uh, so beta carotenes uh, all that stuff it's just really good mm -hmm. and your leafy crop especially the if you're harvesting the leaf of your root crops some of your best nutrients are out of that so the carrots are 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 healthy but the carrot tops are even healthier for right. you, but yeah. they're just hard to use. They don't have recipes on how to eat a carrot top. So <laughs> juicing. Juicy. Yeah. But the lettuces too, talking about beautiful, uh, there's a red uh, romaine lettuce that is absolutely gorgeous. That in a pot with some things around it. Beautiful. Yeah. There's a speckled lettuce, which is probably one of my favorites because it's kind of green and red. It has that variegated look to it. Um, I really like that one in containers, and it's just pretty to eat, too, in a salad. Absolutely yeah. gorgeous. Uh, the oak leaf lettuces, usually they come in a mixed pack with red and green. Very, very pretty. Very, very good for you. Um, so easy just to go out and pick, make your salad, juice it, do whatever you want with it. If you're new to gardening, let's say you get a first-time home buyer, or you're just getting started, you, have, you finally have your own garden plot. Start with the spring vegetables. Mm -hmm. They're so much easier to grow yes, than the tomatoes and the cucumbers and the eggplants. They can be more finicky, and you've got everything that likes to eat them. So bugs and pestilence and disease gets on them. This early season, there's hardly anything out there, right? And they just they're just easy to grow, and so they taste so good. Get some, and a lot of it's started by seeds. So it's more yeah, economical as definitely. well. Definitely, great advice, Lisa. Hey, Ken and Lisa Lane and the Mountain Gardeners, be right back. The Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of Arizona with local garden expert and the Mountain Gardener himself, Ken Lane. Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. Hi, Waters here with this week's Plant of the Week and our show-off for Scythias. A new standout for Scythia with very large, very bright solar yellow flowers that adorn the plant from head to toe. Relax! This showy spring shrub is beautiful and requires no pruning or cleanup. This show-off is just days away from bloom and limited, so don't wait until these for Scythia are all gone at just $21. 
Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott. Where people who love show off for Scythia love to shop. So I was talking fertilizers, plant foods. Let me just simplify this for you. Uh, there's, it's so confusing. Oh, you basically have, um, you've got chemicals, so which are basically petroleum-based products. Those are your Scott's Turf Builders, your Orthos, your Peters. There's a whole series of chemical manufacturers that, that pelletize uh, f- fertilizer, and you spread this. They're usually high in nitrogen. So if you have one of those little white pellets land on a leaf, it'll actually spot the leaf or burn the leaf. If you dump it on a lawn, it'll actually leave a hole. It'll actually kill off that hole and where, where it spilled. You can see where it spilled. It'll mark your flowers. So chemicals are, are there's a place for them, but they're fast released. They're usually cheap, so they're, they're inexpensive. So you can get a lot of food for the, for the money. Uh, and, and that's the one you'll see featured at the front entrance to your drugstore, your box store. Your It's the front one. Well, now's the time. Hey, Scott's turf builder, put this on. Uh, I, don't, I don't suggest you use that kind of food in the mountains of Arizona, and let me tell you why. First of all, we don't have water resources that a lot of other folks do. We don't have access to the Colorado, at least here in this central highland area, um, like Phoenix does or Yuma does. Uh, here we are dealing with well water. So all of our water comes from the rain, gets into the soil, gets percolates down, and then we pump it back out. That's our water source. Anything that's on the ground gets percolated with that water, and you are able to poison yourself. If you've got a little bit shallower well, or you, you folks in Chino Valley and Paulden and Skull Valley and Kirkland, you know what I'm talking about because you, you are dependent on, you've got your own well. I would not recommend using chemicals where if I've got well water, I'm drinking. But what you don't realize is you folks in the city, you're also drinking well water. So we all are. They punch a whole straw in the ground and they suck it out. They put it in a tank. They pump it to your house, filter it, hopefully. Uh, that That's the process. So I'm an advocate for using organic fertilizers. They're better for your gardens because they're slower release. They're, they're, the, the plant can pick up all of the nutrients, whereas a synthetic, they're faster released. And so they release all at once, usually within a two, three week span. They just all release all their, their nutrients and it comes at the plant so fast, they literally don't have time to pick it all up. And they're very water soluble. So if you do get a heavy rain or storm event, it can, it can liquidate some of that fertilizer and then wash it downstream. And thus, you, you, we start drinking your fertilizer you had. So uh, I feel a responsibility just at, at my garden center. I'm going to sell, I don't know, four or five truckloads, thousands of pounds of fertilizer into the marketplace. I have a responsibility to, for my customers, my community, to sell things that are, are more sustainable, uh, healthier for your plant. And it just works better for your plant. So we, we put together... The main ingredient that we put together in ours is cottonseed meal. It's got some bird guano and sulfur and iron. But basically, it's an organic fertilizer. So as the water hits it, it releases a little bit, not all at once like a chemical fertilizer. So the plant can, can take some of it in this rain event or this irrigation cycle. Then, it, then as the rain hits it again, it releases a little bit more. And so instead of a three-week release that you'd get with a chemical, you'll get three months out of a organic fertilizer. This is a game changer. If you don't have any real fertilizer in your, in your landscape as it is, you don't have topsoil. You have clay and rock and caliche and all kinds of nasty stuff, uh, but you don't have nutrients. So if your plants are more dependent on you as the gardener, the homeowner, to feed them, to keep them looking healthy, Organics are the way to go because it releases just a little bit over a very long period of time. Organics are complicated, so that's the negative. Now, I, I love organic fertilizers. I love all that, how to make plants grow. And so I've put my own recipe together. But if you do some research, I'm going, you know, one part blood meal to three parts bone meal to feather meal. To, they got all these parts that you try to mix together, and it's complicated. We just pelletized ours and put it into a bag, and it's all it's pre-mixed. 
And so it's much, much easier to use organics in the yard than, than, than ever before. And then you put it on once and you're set. Really, you fertilize this one time and then you're set until next, really, whenever the monsoons hit in July. That's when you'll want to fertilize again. So the plants are very hungry as they wake up, right, this time of year. So if you can be as they're hungry, put a, put a, put a meal out in front of them. And so we have it, we call it all-purpose plant food. It's good for trees. It's exceptionally good for evergreens, fruit trees, things that bloom or, or, or fruit. It does a really good job. That's that cottonseed meal that does such a good job with that. That's kind of lowers the pH and then feeds it so they can have more nutrients available to the plant. It really, really works. So I put all-purpose plant food on everything. Uh, it's a 744 mix. I should mention that too. So there's numbers on fertilizers. So ours is 744, 7% nitrogen, 4% phosphorus, 4% potash. Uh, so th what do those things do? The first number is nitrogen. It creates green leafy growth. It's important for lawns. It's important for uh, trees, deciduous trees, things that are leafing out on us right now. They need that nitrogen. The phosphorus, the middle number, that creates... Uh, roots and blooms and fruit fruits basically so if it's going to bloom and if you want to bring the fragrance out or the make a tomato larger or apples bigger you give it that middle number the last number is potash that is disease resistance the thickness of the leaf the thickness of the stem the hardiness to, to against leaf spots that's that last number Generally, most of us have a lot of potash in our soil that naturally occurs because all the mountaintops you see around northern Arizona, they're old volcano cores. So Thumb Butte in the middle of Prescott, that is a volcano. The core is left. All the ash has washed off of that core and now has filled the valleys. And so you've got a lot of naturally occurring ash in your soil already. Don't need more. Don't need a lot of it. So a little bit goes a long ways with that. But you do need nitrogen and phosphorus. You need to be consistent with that. So you put the all-purpose plant food on. Now, in addition, I also in my own yard put soil sulfur down. Let me explain why. The water that we use is extremely alkaline. So you've got your pH. You've had a pool or a spa before. You know you're checking your pH often. And so you check that pH to see its scale of 0 to, to 10, basically, towards the low end. So 0, 2, 3, 4, 5, that's acidic. And higher, the higher number, the more alkaline. I've literally seen 9.2 come into out of a soil test. 9.2, that's virtually sterile. I mean, and it's the water that's doing it. We're pumping our, our water out of the ground. And it's coming through all this ash layer that was all the volcanoes. I'll kind of tie it all together here. That There's a lot of ash in our soil, which is very alkaline. Then we're using groundwater to pull that out of the ground. So fill up out of a well and fill up a tank and send it to your house. So you'll find that your water is very alkaline, whether you're in your own well or you're using city water. You need to counteract that. And so the book says the perfect pH is between 6 and 6.5. I've never seen a 6 come out of any soil test out of anywhere in northern Arizona because of all the ash that naturally occurs in your soil and because of the water that we're using. So your gardens will naturally take on, after a season's worth of irrigation, Whatever the pH of your water is, that is what your soil is going to, to, to take on. So it's going to be that. So the sulfur helps to counteract that. It makes things more acidic. This is very unique to the mountains of Arizona. It's nowhere else. Maybe this little bubble of the Southwest has alkaline soils. The rest of the country is dealing with acidic. They're saying add lime to your soil. You heard lime sweetens the soil. This is all of your Chicago to Boston, down to D.C., the south, that's all very acid. So they're saying, use lime. Never use lime here in Arizona. Or rarely use it. You want to use the opposite of lime, which is soil sulfur. Sulfur makes things more acidic. So we're bringing closer to the correct pH level, which means that your fruits, you'll have more blossoms, better fragrance, 
Uh, the color on your leaves will be darker green. You'll have better color on your fruits and your flowers. It's, a, it's really a game changer. And I only use it in the spring. I'll do everything in the landscape with soil sulfur. It looks like little sulfur pellets. And that's the only time I put it on. Every time water or rain hits that, it just makes things more acidic, which makes the garden healthier. So food and sulfur. That's what I did in my entire landscape this week. Be right back. The Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of Arizona with local garden expert and the Mountain Gardener himself, Ken Lane. Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. Let's talk poop. Hey, I'm Tommy at Waters Garden Center. Ken and Lisa are out right now, so I snuck in to remind you that it's time to add some manure to your garden. It's been a wet winter, and your soil is, well, pooped. Waters Barnyard Manure adds nutrients to get your garden growing. It's organic and odorless, so we really can say our poop don't stink. Buy six bags or more. They're only $5.99. Now that's a load of crap. Tommy, what's going on? Oh, poop, gotta go. Natural, safe, odorless, and organic at Waters Garden Center. Just some parting advice as we wrap this show up. Um, Important, fertilize everything in the landscape. Use an organic fertilizer. If not, come in. I've made one with these these two hands called all-purpose plant food. Uh, food's kind of a game. You'll find you'll at the at the stores you'll see geranium food and pansy food and rose food and fruit tree food and evergreen food. That's just a ploy the food companies put together to get you to buy more fertilizer. A food is a food is a food. Get a good quality rounded food that's balanced and give it to your entire landscape. So we only have one fertilizer here at, at Waters Garden Center. We put it together. It's for it's for the mountains of Arizona. It's for Arizona. Um, it, just put it, sling it on there. Uh, it'll go through the rock. It will go through the fabrics. It won't go through plastic, but it will go through all the leafy materials and stuff. Just get it on there and walk away. You don't have to work it in or do anything fancy. Just get it on there. I'll use, just walk around with my hand spreader and I sling it around. Works. Put soil sulfur on everything in spring, in the month of March. Do this all in the month of March. Soil sulfur fertilizer and finish up. If you've got rock lawns, I cannot emphasize this enough. Put weed and grass stopper on top of your rock lawn or anywhere where you've got weeds showing up. Fence lines. That front, the 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 wash out by the front road, that that walkway there, anywhere where you got weeds gathering, put weed and grass preventer. While you've got that hand spreader, it's, uh, fill it up with this granular material. Spread it. It goes in the soil and it keeps seed from germinating. It really reduces the amount of of headache you're going to have, the weeding you're going to have. It's really noticeable. Uh, well, I've got weed fabric underneath my rock. I, mean, I know. But the, the, there's silt and dust and stuff gets in between the rocks and weeds still come up. I put it over top of the rock lawns, anywhere I just, I really despise weeding. I just don't like it. And so I put my weed and grass proof in. That's the main thing I can tell you right now. And then for your evergreens, put plant protector on right away. All this in the month of March. I'll, maybe I'll try to write a garden column on that, just to emphasize that. That'd be valuable. Put it in print. Also help me explain it over the airwaves a little better. Uh, we do have garden classes. We hold every Saturday at 930 a garden class. They're free. They're meant to be informative. And our philosophy is we want, we're want we not selling plants. We're selling garden experiences. And so with that, you need to make sure that your customers are informed on how to actually grow this plant better. And so we're very informative. We put lots of content, garden classes, garden columns, YouTube videos. We're very interactive online. Um, look for that. You'll find it. You can't, you, can't, you can't miss it so that you'll be a better gardener so you have more successes. Next week, we've got roses. We grow roses better than anyone. So Cheryl, our, our, our plant, she's our rose queen. She's going to teach the class on how to grow better roses, how to prune them back, how to fertilize them, how to, what varieties are coming, when they're coming, what's the sequence of the roses. And I'm sure we'll get into other fragrant uh, uh, 
uh, bushes as well. Spring open houses the 17th and 18th of March. And then trees, the trees of spring, March 24th. I'm sure I'll help teach that class. Uh, a big one that you might, that you'll have to sign up for. There's a minor fee for this because it's a make and take home with you. It's advanced container designs. Lisa and the crew are going to teach you how to put together a great container of flowers. It'll actually be hands-on, interactive. We'll have lots of plants there, soils, all the experts. You'll put something together and take it home with you on March 31st. Anyway, take a look at all of those classes at watersgardencenter.com and look at the class tab at the very top. And of course, Lisa and I camp out here at Waters Garden Center. Come say hi. Anything we can do for you, we like helping friends. The Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of Arizona with local garden expert and the Mountain Gardener himself, Ken Lane. Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. The colors of spring are bursting at Waters' 56th Spring Open House. Talk directly to our farmers as they show off the newest flowers, brightest evergreens, and this year's newest bloomers. Friday, we have free shamrocks with the purchase of evergreen trees. Saturday and Sunday, it's impromptu garden classes, sidewalk art, cornhole contest, and drawings. Join the garden fun at Waters Garden Center's 56th Spring Open House, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, March 16th through 18th. 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott. Ouch! Aw, man, another rock! Hi, I'm Rusty. You know, the shovel you're destroying trying to dig that hole? Sure, I get it. You got these beautiful plants at Waters Garden Center. Waters asked if they could plant them for you, but no. You had to do it yourself, even though they would plant, deliver, and guarantee your plants for two years. I hope I don't end up like that old pickaxe. Ouch! Prevent yard tool abuse. Waters Garden Center. They plant, deliver, and guarantee. You've been listening to local garden expert Ken Lane, the owner of Waters Garden Center in Prescott. Join him each week as he answers timely garden questions unique to the area. He can be found throughout the week at Waters Garden Center, located in Prescott at 1815 Iron Springs Road. Thanks for tuning in to The Mountain Gardener.